Welcome to today's Bible teaching with Pastor Mike Bernard of Shoreline Community Church in North Bend, Oregon. We hope you will be blessed as we explore the riches of God's Word verse by verse. Please open your Bible and join us for today's message. Here's Pastor Mike. The topic of our message today is understanding Christian liberty, and we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 13. And so I think what I'm going to do today is ask if you would please stand in the honor of reading God's Word. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge, for some with consciousness of an idol, until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol, and their consciousness being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we better, nor if we, if we do not eat are we the worst. Lord, thank you once again for your word, and as we enter here, uh, I, I just pray that you would speak to each and every one of our hearts today as we address some incredibly hard topics that are so relevant to our culture today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Out of all the books of the New Testament, I think the book that really relates to me, relates to the American culture the most would be 1 Corinthians. And the issue that we cover in here are, are the very issues that we're facing today. And even as we look at the topic here in chapter 8, right off the bat, the, the issue here is, should a Christian eat meat that has been sacrificed to an idol? And there's probably many people here today saying, oh man, what's that got to do with me today? But I'm hoping that as we get through this and we get towards the end, that you'll see exactly what it is that I'm talking about. The Moody Bible Commentary says, Paul addressed another question from Corinth. He had been addressing a series of questions that the church there had, had addressed him with because over time they began to stray. There was questions. What do you do? You go back to the church planner. You go back to the apostle. You throw those questions by him and, and see what he has to say. The Moody Bible Commentary says, Paul addressed another question from, from Corinth, namely the eating of things sacrificed to idols. Food offered to the gods was often eaten as a sacred meal in their honor. If one was invited to such a meal, he was expected to go, and spiritual, social, and business ties were strengthened at these times. To decline such an invitation consistently was considered antisocial and could result in commercial suicide. It is un understandable why the Corinthians would insist on continuing to go, though they no longer worship these gods. And so here's the thing. If you lived in the city of Corinth, it, 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 they would have all of these things that would be happening by the temple. Maybe the weddings would be there. Maybe certain celebrations would be there. And if you wanted to be able to function within that society, they expected you to be there. They expected you to go to those things. To not go to them would be to distance yourself from the people. It would be to commit financial suicide. But these individuals who had been raised in that culture, that culture of pagans, had, had changed to Christ. There, had been, they were, there were new creatures in Jesus Christ. How should they react to these challenges that they were facing? And it was serious enough at this point that the church sent the letter to the Apostle Paul asking him the question, how should we deal with the situation? You see, 
seeing Christians eat this meat was causing weaker believers to stumble in their spiritual walk. And now, as, as we come to chapter 8, we're, we're in a, a group of chapters now. Chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 10. And there's going to be issues that are being covered in here. In fact, there's three issues in particular that we're going to see that are going to be addressed. Number one, was it okay for Christian, for a Christian, to buy meat in the market that was previously sacrificed to idols? Well, you'd go to the store, you want to get your meat, and, and well, lo and behold, the meat they had here that was at the temple is a whole lot cheaper than the other meat that was there. Is it okay for a Christian to walk up and purchase the meat that you're going to be eating at the store, knowing that it had previously been meat that had been sacrificed to an idol, which was really nothing? Number two, was it acceptable for a Christian to eat meat that was offered to an idol as a guest in a friend's home? You're invited over to dinner. You head on over to dinner with your friend. You're sitting there, you're getting ready to dig into that delicious looking meat. And all of a sudden you find out that that meat had previously been sacrificed to an, to, to an idol at the temple. Are you free to eat that meat? Should you decline eating that meat? These are the kind of problems that the Christians in Corinth were facing. How do we react? And then third, was it acceptable for a Christian to eat meat offered to an idol at a pagan temple? You're invited to the wedding. You head there. They serve food. Are you allowed to eat the meat there? And this was a big question that was going on in the city of Corinth. And today you're probably thinking, well, what in the world has meat being offered to an idol got to do with us today? Well, the deeper question that we're addressing right here is that of Christian liberty. How far can we go? How far should we go with our Christian liberty? What about the 20th, 21st century? Uh, Christians are trying to decide on the liberties that we have today. Should a Christian drink wine? Should a Christian gamble? Should have a lottery tickets? You know, should, should a Christian go to a movie? Should a Christian dance out in public? We end up in Christianity having a lot of gray areas that we've got to look at, we've got to decipher through, we've got to decide what is the proper way for you and me as Christians to react. And so those are the issues down deep that the Apostle Paul is covering in here. So I ask for your patience as we work through here because each of you are going to receive this a little bit differently depending upon your personal convictions with the Word of God. Verse 1, now concerning these things, concerning things, excuse me, offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Knowledge puffs up. Knowledge has a way of making us proud, doesn't it? We, we, we start thinking, well, gosh, I, I, I know these idols are nothing. I know these idols are, are, are just wood or, or they're stone. And we begin to puff up. But what Paul says right off of the bat is, is a message that we need to grasp today. But love edifies. And throughout this entire section, we're going to see that it's the, the way of love that we need to follow. You see, what knowledge is he talking about? That those idols are absolutely nothing. And the food that they ate is to idols that go to nothing. Well, when the food was divided, it was divided up in four different ways. The first part of the offerings that were done were, were, were put on the altar and they were offered to whatever God it was that they were worshiping. It was burnt offerings. The second, very much like the Old Testament, were offerings that would go to the priest. You would see that, that uh, the priests were able to eat from the offerings. And the third was that the offerings would also go to the person in the family that was doing the offering, that they would get to eat some of that as well. The issue here is that the leftover meat is meat that would be taken to the market. That was meat that would be for sale, that if you were to walk down to the market looking for meat for your family, you would be brought to the choice that some of these meats that are in front of you had previously been, been offered to an idol. Well, people who are very knowledgeable with little love are susceptible to that pride. And an old Christian once said, some Christians grow, others just swell. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> yeah, it, when, when, when you get 
proud. When you get prideful, you don't reach a whole lot of people and you don't generally operate in a way of love. Love looks out for the welfare of others. Love takes the, the best into consideration for other people. And the ultimate example in scripture of, of the way of love and of love and, and humility is the Lord Jesus Christ himself when he laid down his life for you and for me and for our sins. Well, verse 2 goes on, it says, And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing, yet as he ought to know. I remember that when I was a brand new Christian, I used to think I had the tiger by the tail. And that was until I got face to face with a Jehovah's Witness who in about five minutes had me tied in such a knot, I, I didn't know up from down. And it's, it's interesting that we, we need to prepare ourselves before we go out there as Christians. We tend to think we know the whole thing. But the more you dig, the more you find that that is a really big iceberg. In fact, you end up finding out that there's, there's more than just reading the Bible. You hear people say, I, I read the Bible. And that's a great thing. In fact, we want to read the Bible. In fact, I would encourage you to read the Bible every year if you can do it. Because this is God's le love letter to us. This is how we get to know him. This is how we get to know what pleases him. This is our guidebook for life, and we should read it, not in a legalistic sense, but in the sense that we love him, and we want to get to know him more deeply and more intimately. But this is just the surface. And as you begin to dig in, what you find out is there's soteriology, the study of salvation, Christology, the study of Jesus Christ, pneumatology, the study of the Holy Spirit, eschatology, the study of end times, epistemology, the study of, of language, ecclesiology, the study of the church. You've got the study of cultures. You've got the study of languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And I'm still trying to get educated on English. I'm still working on that. But what I'm saying is the greatest minds in the world can spend their entire life digging through this, this treasure and never get all of the depths of it. it. People have to go different directions and then bring the minds together because the Word of God is so deep and it's so magnificent. Over time I've come to realize, <laughs> the, the, the more I've come to realize, the more I realize the less that I know. You see, what matters is how we use this book in love, that we follow the way of love. No one has exhaustive knowledge. One of my heroes of the faith has always been Charles Spurgeon, and Spurgeon lived from 1834 to 1892. Uh, remarkable man. He used to fill up the Metropolitan Tabernacle in London six times a week with 6,000 people in a day and age in which there was no microphone. They had sounding boards, and he would just have to bellow it out and preach to those people. He seldom left his churches that were in the London area, and yet it said that he spoke to over 10,000 people during his lifetime face to face. But where he was really powerful is his written word and his written sermons. And I'm, I'm kind of interested, how many of you have Sp Spurgeon sermons at home? I want to see a raise of hands. Look around. There's quite a few people that do have, the ser uh, have sermons at home. Charles Spurgeon had his sermons written in 20 different languages, and they were sent around the world. And it said that there, he's done more writing than any writer in the history of the Christian church. If you were to take all of the writings of Charles Spurgeon and put them into volumes, you would have volumes the size of the Encyclopedia Britannica. Imagine that, the complete Encyclopedia Britannica. In the short amount of years that he lived, it said that he did the work of three different people. Spurgeon was amazing. Spurgeon, at six years old, uh, his father and grandfather were both pastors. He would go over to the house of his grandfather and he would sit there with the pastors as they came and they began to, to debate the works of the Puritans. Now, I don't know how many of you here have ever picked up the works of the Puritans, but back in those days, they didn't know where to put a period. And they just kept going and going and going. And it's not easy stuff to read. At six years old, Spurgeon was debating with the pastors of his day. The Puritans. Amazing. As he grew, he was a voracious reader. Reader, reading all the time. He, he was an incredible reader. And Spurgeon ended up putting a, a library together of 12,000 volumes. Now back in that day, that was a, a lot of volumes. They had a lot of books that they had in there. But they said of Spurgeon that he had almost a photographic memory. Spurgeon could be talking about something. He'd walk in that library of 12,000 books and he'd go right to the book that he's referring to. He'd pull it out. He'd flip right to the page where it was and make the quotation. 
The man was absolutely brilliant. If anyone over the ages, he's called the prince of preachers. If anyone over the ages uh, would, would, would have that knowledge that should, should bring respect, it would be Charles Spurgeon. But with Spurgeon, it was more than knowledge. It was a love for the people. It was a love for the Lord Jesus Christ and a desire to reach the people for Christ. Spurgeon, the most famous preacher of his day, you would think when the plague hit London that Spurgeon would have said, I'm going to let my elders go and other people go over here. My work is far too important for me to go out with those people and risk getting this plague and, and being taken out. But the great the great man, the great heart that he had for his people, Spurgeon went out and Spurgeon ended up going to the bedside of his people with the plague and praying with them. He operated out of love and chose to go the way of love. That's what we need to do today. Knowledge is important, but it's got to be accompanied by love. Well, verse 3 goes on, it says, but if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. In other words, how can you identify a Christian today? Well, most people would say, well, they're hypocrites. That's how you identify them, right? The way that we should identify Christians today is love. That should be the mark of a Christian. You should be able to see something different in their lives that you know that they are a believer in Jesus Christ and Christ has changed them forever. Verse 4 says, Therefore concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is no other gods but one. So should Christians eat meat offered to idols? After all, they're not real. I mean, an idol is just the substance of whatever it is. It's a rock. It's a piece of wood. It's been carved by somebody. It's a golden calf. What's the big deal? They're not real anyways. In fact, Paul would go on and say that an idol is nothing in the world. They are nothing but the work of men's hands. We see the psalmist talking about this when he says, but our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. Their idols are silver and gold and the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, eyes they have, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses they have, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not handle. Feet they have, but they do not walk. Nor do they mutter through their throat. Those who make them are like them. So is everyone who trusts in them. Have you ever heard somebody is kind of stone-headed? Maybe this is the idea. If you worship an idol, you're just kind of stone-headed. But you look at them, and, and they are the substance of wood or stone. There is no life in them. They have no power to hurt you. They have no, no, no strength. Or they can't speak. They can't hear. They can't do anything. Why are we afraid of them? You see, and even as those stones are without spiritual life, so are the people who worship them. These so-called gods in reality are nothing but the creation of man. Well, verses 5 and 6 say this. It says, for even, even if there are so-called gods... You see, in Greek and Roman mythology, uh, the, the Greeks believe in all kinds of gods, and the Corinthians were Greeks. And so for them, this whole polytheism, all of these gods would be normal to them. This is a change to go to one god. And, and so it says, Paul says, even if there are so-called gods, and he's mocking them, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God and Father of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. See, there's quite a difference, isn't there? The Greeks that these Corinthians were, that the whole system that they were converting out of was a belief in many gods, many little g gods. But to come to Christianity was to believe in one God. You see, as Orthodox Christians today, we believe in, in one God revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Equal in essence, different in role. 
And that's exactly what Paul picks up here is we've got one God revealed in three persons, equal in essence, different in role. He looks at the role of the Father. He looks at the role of the Son. He's not questioning the Holy Trinity. He's demonstrating the unity within. Now, for the majority of us Christians, we're very familiar with Genesis chapter 1 where it says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We understand this. We realize that God is the creator of all it is. But as we go into the Gospel of John, things change just a little bit. And we see that Paul is pointing out that the Father is the source of all creation. Well, Jesus is God's creating agent. In John chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, it says, In the beginning was the Word. That word, Word, in, in the Greek is the word logos. In the beginning is the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. You see the separation within the Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one God, different role. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the, in the beginning with God. Excuse me, let's say it again. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. Today we look at tender Jesus, the Lamb of God. We see Jesus dying on the cross and being buried and risen again. But how often do we think of Jesus as God's creating agent? How often do we think of Jesus as the creator of everything you see and everyone around? Uh, what, that ought to put us on our faces before him. And in fact, as we see in Colossians chapter 1 verse 16, it says, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or power. All things were created through him and for him. It's not just the visible, but Christ created the invisible. He created the heavens and he created the earth. You see, our God is the sovereign creator of heaven and earth, and all other gods are fake. So the question here is, why be afraid of them? Should we go ahead and, and eat the meat? What's the big deal? Well, one thing is that these so-called gods may be demonically inspired, or at least the creation of them would be demonically uh, in, inspired from the beginning. But I think it's important for us to remember that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And we shouldn't be afraid of, of these false gods. Verse 7. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of, of the idol until now eat it as a thing offered to an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. In other words, many of the converts who were at the church in Corinth were, were uh, recent converts. Uh, paganism was a real thing. It's what they were raised with. They had lived in, in, in that, that kind of a setting. Well, to them, eating the meat was tantamount to participating in pagan worship all over again. Their minds, in their minds, they were exposing themselves to their old demons and they were sinning against Christ. Warren Wiersbe writes, he says, all of this offended the weaker Christians. Many of them had been saved out of pagan idolatry. They could not understand why their fellow believers would want to have anything to do with meat sacrifice to idol. There was a, a potential division in the church, and so the leaders asked Paul for counsel. They've got this issue, and so the leadership of the church, what do you do? You go to the founder. You ask the founder, okay, what, how should we react in this particular situation? And so Paul begins to write back and to demonstrate some specific principles. The question that Paul really had to answer here is the question of Christian liberty. What are Christians free to do? What are they not free to do? And so we begin to check and, 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 and examine some of these issues. One of the few things, and I'll repeat few things, that I miss about California is the burritos. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you've been there. You got those big old burritos. And I'll tell you, that barbecue pork, they get this big round pork up on, they get a metal bar up with the pork around and they bring the barbecue down. You have, man, those burritos are so good. And we have every right to sit down in a Mexican restaurant and enjoy those awesome barbecue pork burritos. But if you had a Jewish friend, would you take that Jewish friend to the Mexican restaurant and offer them barbecue pork burritos? 
Why? It'd be really offensive to them, wouldn't it? They have a real problem with that, with the law of God, and, 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 and they're dealing with it. It would it'd be an issue that would make them stumble. We see the same thing today with Muslims, where the Muslims, they, they have a struggle with, with eating pork. You wouldn't want to invite somebody over and put pork in front of them unless you wanted to insult them, which means we need to be very careful when we serve breakfast and we put bacon and ham in front of people. We went to, interestingly enough, we went to Israel several years ago and, and we got over there and uh, you go into those buffet type, type meals. And so we got into Israel and I love my breakfast, bacon and eggs and pancakes. And I walked down there and yeah, <laughs> they had fish, they had nuts, they had fruit, chocolate, porridge like or whatever it was and all these things, but, but they didn't have bacon and eggs. In fact, they didn't even have eggs, did they? It was very seldom that we saw eggs. Interestingly enough, when we went to Jordan and we got to the, the motel, it was a very Americanized or Western hotel, and we walked downstairs and we had bacon and, and eggs there. But the point is, is if you're, if you're out there and you're trying to reach somebody for Christ, and it's a strong belief of theirs, is it, is it something that you really want to do is just kind of throw it in their face and cause a stumbling block for them? Or do you want to be sensitive to the needs in, in which they have? Well, here's another question for you. Is it all right for a Christian to gamble? Now, my parents weren't Christians, but as I was growing up, they went to gamble quite often. But something my mom said always stuck in my mind because she was really disciplined. She, she would go in there and she'd go with a roll of nickels and she'd have that one roll of nickels or she'd go with a roll of pennies and she'd look at us and she'd say, this roll is my fun money. Once this is done, I'm done and she would go and play the machines. Now that's one extreme. On the other extreme, several years ago, I had a young Coast Guardsman come into my office and he was having marital problems. And so we're talking and we begin working through the, the marriage problems that he was going through and I, I'm listening and I'm bringing out more information from him. And the longer that I do that, I start finding out why he's having marital problems. He's got a gambling problem. Now, in the old days, you would take your money into the casinos and you would play until all of that money was gone and you'd return home broke. But today, when all that money is gone, now they give the, the option of using your credit card. This young man had worked up $40,000 in debt and he was wondering what was wrong with his marriage. You know, you get something like that. They are in the business of taking your money. They're, they're, you see all these beautiful buildings popping up. They don't just pop up because they're nice. They pop up because they're taking your money. And you stop and you think about what that money could have done for the kingdom of Christ. Here's a question for you. Should Christians even walk into a bar or a casino? Cheryl's parents lived in Nevada. And those of you who have ever gone to Nevada, every single place you go is a casino. You walk into the grocery store and it's a casino. You walk into 7-Eleven and it's a casino. You walk into the restaurant and it's a casino. You walk into the bowling alley and it's a casino. You just about got to go and crawl into a cave if you want to reach somebody for Christ because, I, because that's where they're at in that environment. This whole topic of Christian liberty, I, I, I wrote this definition for you. Christian liberty is the freedom we have in Christ to live our lives according to the dictates of our consciences as guided by sacred scripture and guided by the Holy Spirit. Let me say that once again. Christian liberty is the freedom that we have in Christ to live our lives according to the dictates of our consciences as guided by sacred scripture and God's Holy Spirit. Question, what about eating in restaurants that are bars? Should Christians even step foot? Should you go to a place like the coach house or some other place? Well, one of the most famous Sunday schools in all Christian history actually took place in a saloon. Back in the early 1800s, D.L. Moody was going into ministry. He was just a young man. He had come from the East Coast to the, to the rough, wild west town of Chicago. And as he was there, he, he didn't have the education. He was on fire for Christ. It's funny because even years later when they talked about D.L. Moody, they would say the man butchered the English language, but the man was filled with the Holy Spirit. And many people were coming to Christ. 
Moody got to Chicago and he noticed all the rough kids, the ragamuffins that were out in the streets of Chicago. And he went around trying to find a place to take them to Sunday school. And the church has said, look, you want to get a ministry going for these young people? You need to start it yourself. And so what Moody did is he began to look for a place to meet. And Moody found an abandoned saloon, and that's where he took that Sunday school. And they began calling these ragamuffins Moody's Scholar. Moody uh, had a heart to reach people for Christ. And by the way, Child Evangelism Fellowship tells us that the most effective time to reach someone for Christ is between the ages of 4 and 14, that 85% of the people who are going to come to Christ do so between the ages of 4 and 14. So what did D.L. do? He knew that children liked ponies. So he got his pony. He got a bunch of oranges with him. He walked through the streets of Chicago with his pony, and he recruited kids over and over and over again until he filled up that saloon. Once they got that done, he looked for another building. He began doing the same thing. In fact, he got to a building that they had a seating arrangement of 1,200 people, and he was sure that God wanted him to bring 1,200, and he kept doing it and doing it. Hundreds and hundreds of people. Well, you know the rest of the story with Moody is he ends up becoming one of the foremost evangelists of all time. Time. And it all began in an empty, abandoned saloon. It was a building. Moody had the spirit and took the spirit into that building. We had a situation a while back. Our next door neighbors uh, had been living together. And they asked me to marry them. And I said I would, but they needed to separate for a while. In fact, we even offered that they could come and stay in our house so that we could do it and do it biblically and, and work through some of these things. And they said, well, thank you, but no thank you. But they did turn around and they invited us to their wedding. Back in those days, there were many people in the church that were absolutely offended at the idea of a Christian walking into the milk casino. And uh, I, I was in a dilemma. They invited us to their wedding. And I talked to, to Cheryl, and Cheryl looked at me, and she said, Mike, what would Jesus do? And I had to think for about half a minute, and I said he would go to that wedding as a witness. And we ended up going to that wedding as a witness. You know, here's the thing on these casinos. When you do go into the casinos, if you do, why are you going in there? Are you going in there to join in the ways of the world? Are you going in there to party it up? Or are you going in there with the purpose of reaching somebody with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And I think that's the question that we need to ask each other. Why, why are we doing the things that we're doing? Why would we do something like that? Are we going to witness Christ or are we going to party? Verse 8, but food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we better, nor, we do not, nor if we do not eat are we worse. There's nothing inherently evil about food. You know, food in itself is spiritually neutral. What matters is our relationship with Jesus Christ and how the food, or whatever it is that we do, is affecting other people who are watching us. Have you ever noticed that there's a difference between religion and, and a personal relationship with Christ? It's interesting that the theology department that we're in so many universities across our land, and by the way, we shouldn't be afraid of that word theology. Theology means the study of God. And all of us should want to study God. We should want to know God. But if you look at the universities across this land, what you'll find out is that the theology departments are having the name changed now to the religion department. Is there a difference? Yeah. The theology department is the study of God. In reality, religion falls under the category of anthropology, which is the study of man. There's a huge difference in there. And it's not religion. It's not the things that we do or the things that we don't do that bring salvation. What the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 is this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that is not of yourselves. You didn't earn it by the things you did. It's a gift. And that is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We look at that verse all the time when it comes to salvation. And 
what we don't look at in all of this, and we understand that for by grace you've been saved through faith, not yourselves, the gift of God, not a works list, anyone should boast. We've got all kinds of people out there that are trying to earn their way to heaven. But what the Bible says is this. We don't quote verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We are not saved by our good works. Amen. We're saved unto good works. Once we come to Christ, how can you help but desire to, to praise him? And do whatever it is that he's asking you to do. You know, we're saved unto that which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Verse 9. But beware somehow, beware lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. You see, in whatever it is that we're thinking of, we, we got to think of the welfare of other people, other believers. When McDonald says this, he says the principle, of the, the principle of love must come in. A Christian has liberty to eat meat that has been previously offered or sacrificed to idols, but it would be utterly wrong for him to eat if so doing, in so doing, he offends the weaker brother or the sister. And once again, we look at that, that meat offering to idols and we think, meat, uh, wait a minute now. The Christians, 21st century Christians in America have a problem with gluttony. Is that an issue for us today? We don't want to talk about that one, do we? I mean, we'll go on out and eat, but we don't, we don't talk about that issue. How about drinking today? Should Christians be able to drink? Should a Christian be able to have a glass of wine? Well, I've got to tell you, when it comes time for an alcoholic... Okay, that alcoholic should never have a glass of wine because that'll set them off and get them started on, on that whole downward spiral once again. We've had that discussion. We wanted to be as close to the, the, uh, the original church as we could. And when we looked at the communion elements in the very beginning, we talked about that possibility of wine. When, when Jesus instituted communion, it was not grape juice. It was wine, okay? But here's the thing. Today we've got so many alcoholics that are around. Just one sip of that alcohol can put them right in that downward spiral and start the whole thing over once again. It's, we have to be so careful when you come to, the, to that issue. How about dancing? You know, you've got, uh, we've got people here in this church that go, square dancing, is that appropriate? We've got other kinds of dancing. We've, we've got one dear lady in this congregation. I love her. I've known her for a long time. She's been fighting dementia. But every time when she comes to church, she is so happy to be here. She wants to do her happy dance. And you know what? Sometimes you'll see me in the back of the sanctuary doing the happy dance with her because more of us should be wanting to do the happy dance when we come to church. There is absolutely nothing wrong with that. I'm thrilled by that idea. But how about dancing that's inappropriate? How about dancing that does not bring honor to the Lord? I don't think the Christians have the option to, to, to go out there and to do that. Cheryl and I were in a missions organization. I wanted to get in there so bad, they put a piece of paper in front of us. And I couldn't believe what they said. I had to sign saying I would not dance anymore. I had to sign saying I would not go to the movie theater anymore. And I, I, I was stunned by that. And I said, you mean to tell me that my wife and I can't even have a slow dance at a wedding? And they said, that's exactly what we mean to tell you. In the movie theater, it was the time Billy Graham films were coming out. You mean I can't invite people to go to, to, to the movies to see this Billy Graham movies so that they can get the gospel? No, it's the kind of image that you might put out. You know, I, I think it's so important that we look at these things and, and, and we've got areas of Christian liberty, those areas that we can choose that we want to do them or not, but it's so critical that whatever we do, that we make that choice that's going to glorify the Lord. I, uh, after the first service, I was confronted by uh, probably no fewer than three different people and they want me to speak a little bit more on some of the, the more difficult topics. And so I'm going to jump in there in this service and deal with some of those things. What about smoking? I talked a little bit about Charles Spurgeon. In fact, I haven't talked about Charles Spurgeon yet, have I? I must have jumped over that whole section of scripture there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Charles, Charles Spurgeon. Is that coming up? I must have missed it. Anyways, 
Charles Spurgeon was, was an, I got it. He was an incredible guy. And like I said, he, he, um, he was a, the greatest Bible teacher of the 1800s. We still use his works even today. Spurgeon was a smoker. Did you know that? Spurgeon loved a good cigar. And in fact, one day at the Metropolitan Tabernacle, they had a visiting speaker at the evening service. And he was from America. And when he got up there, he began to speak about the vices of smoking and how evil that smoking is. And the congregation was squirming a little bit, knowing that Spurgeon loved his cigars. And they weren't sure what the great preacher was going to say when he got back up there. And so when the American finished just nailing smoking, Spurgeon got up at the end of it and he looked at his congregation and he said, now I'm going to go out and I'm going to have a cigar to the glory of God. <laughs> yeah. However, however, Charles Spurgeon in those days was not aware of the negative medical effects that smoking has on our life today. And so where there's liberties, we need to be so careful to practice those liberties to honor God with our lives in our testimony. The thing I got approached by three people after the first service on was marijuana. What about marijuana? Here's the thing. Generally, when people have recreational marijuana, they do that for one purpose, and that's to get high. And we know in the Bible that it's not a sin to have a single glass of wine. It's not a sin to have a drink. We see that, that Jesus and the apostles had wine. That Jesus actually created wine at the wedding. People say, well, it was grape juice. And if it was grape juice, you would not have so many, so many statements in the Bible about do not get drunk. Okay, it was wine. But the point is, is having a glass of wine is not a sin. Getting drunk is a sin. When you get to that point in which you begin to get a buzz, you have crossed the line. And when do you get to that point? And that's where you need to be careful. My thing with recreational marijuana is that when people have recreational marijuana, they have that with the purpose of getting high, getting that buzz. And that is always wrong. Now, the other part of that question is how about medicinal or medicine when it comes to marijuana? Well, I, I used to be totally 100% against it. I've run into people who could not find relief for what they had with the medications that they had, and yet the marijuana helped them. And so here's the thing. Recreation, always wrong. Okay, when it comes to medicine, now I've never, never done any marijuana, never want to do, medicine or otherwise. But if I was dying of cancer, and I was in extreme pain, and that was the only medication that would help me, I might think twice about that in a medicinal case. Now you look at that and people are saying, no, 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 no. How many of you are on prescriptions? How many of you have taken prescriptions to help in different areas? We don't think anything about that. If a doctor prescribes the, the marijuana medicine, uh, as medicine to help with pain and it's done properly, I would say that that's one of those gray areas in Christianity in which that's between you and the Lord and you need to come to that decision yourself and that's not something I'm going to judge you on. It's not something uh, I'm going to condemn you on. Uh, if it's used in the proper sense, then it's between you and the Lord how you use that. Well, verse 10 says, If anyone sees you who have knowledge eaten in the idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat those things offered to idols? It is never right to eat in an idol's temple. If you're there in the sense that you're participating in the worship, it's never right to be there to do that. It crosses the line between right and wrong. And the individual not only is sinning against other people that are watching them, the individual is sinning against the Lord. You see, the way of love calls us to be careful how we live and how we use our Christian liberties. If the things we go out and do, even some of the things I've spoken about here already today, if the things that we go out and do cause other Christians to stumble, we really need to think about, do we want to be doing them? Do we want to be doing them out in public where people see that kind of stuff as well? Well, sometimes our actions can lead other people into sin against their own conscience. They believe that it's wrong, and to do it, then it becomes wrong. We see in Romans chapter 14, verse 23, where it says, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, 
because he does not eat from faith. For whoever is not from faith, whatever, excuse me, is not from faith, is sin. What about if somebody goes out to a restaurant and they're sitting there with their dinner and they have a glass of wine? A few years back, we had one of the elders in our church was out at a restaurant. He didn't even think anything about it. He was sitting there with his wife and over dinner had a, a glass of wine with that wife. Somebody walked into that restaurant and they saw him. And that became a stumbling block for them. And we became aware of that. And so what do you do in that kind of situation? I think it's so important. It gets to that point of Christian liberty, right and wrong. What can we do? What, things for one person may, may be right with their, their complete confidence to the Lord that what they're doing right and on the other person, they're over here and they're really struggling with that whole issue and it causes them to stumble in their walk and in their trust with you. I think whatever we choose to do in that realm of Christian liberty, we need to take into consideration how it can affect other Christians in their walk and be very careful in doing that or not doing that. But this can be taken to extremes as well. We had a situation a while back where there was another lady in our congregation and she was with her husband who, by the way, is an unbeliever. And they were out at a restaurant in the evening and they had dinner and they had a cup of wine. Another lady in our church saw that. She was furious. And so the lady who had had the glass of wine worked in one of the ministries and she's there. She's working in that ministry on, on a, another night, particular night. And this lady comes rushing into the church. She goes right up to Jesse and she goes, this person has to be removed from ministry immediately. They were having a glass of wine with her husband in a, in a restaurant. And Jesse looked and she said, no. And we ended up talking about it later on on this whole issue. What's a sin for some people is not a sin for other people. And I think as Christians, we need to be gracious to take that whole concept of Christian liberty in the gray areas and not become judgmental ourselves where we begin to, to look down on other people and pound on other people. For the alcoholic, you should never have that wine. For the person who's with an alcoholic, substitute your liberty to keep that person from falling back into that downward spiral. Follow the way of love in whatever it is that you do. You see, the important thing here is even if we have the liberty, we need to think about the actions that we're doing and how they're going to affect other Christians who may or may not have the same convictions that we have. Verse 11, and because of your knowledge... And because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish? Shall the weak brother be removed for whom Christ died? Paul's not implying in, uh, in, in any way, <laughs> he's not implying in any way that this brother or sister loses their salvation. But what he is implying is that their testimony has been injured. It's been injured se severely. Their trust in, in the people around them has been injured. Have you ever known somebody that's gone out there and they've done something that you disapprove of? Or whatever it might be, you've seen them and maybe they feel it's totally right. You feel it's totally wrong. It affects the way that you look at that person. We need to be so careful in what we do, realizing that, for, that, that that's an individual whom Christ died for. Do you realize how valuable you are to God and the incredible love that he has for you, that he redeemed you. And when you go out and you take a brother or sister in Christ that's coming along in their growth and you cause them to stumble in their faith, you've not only sinned against that person, but you've sinned against Jesus who gave it all for them so that they could be forgiven, that they could have new life, that they could have a hope in him. You see, Paul doesn't command us to abandon our Christian liberties, but he simply is saying exercise wisdom when you're using those Christian liberties. Verse 12, but when you thus sin against the brethren and you wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Are a few pieces of meat really worth destroying somebody's walk with Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus said, he said, and the king will answer and say to them, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. When we sin against the brethren, we sin against Christ. Have you ever noticed that the more we sin, the easier it gets? 
It's, it's, it's something. I mean, well, you'll have something where maybe your conscience is saying that's right. You end up seeing somebody else doing it. You get lulled into this thing where you begin doing something that you never did before. And before long, at first when you go in, your, your, your conscience is telling you this is wrong. I shouldn't be doing it. But the more you do it, something happens. What is that? You become hardened to it. You become desensitized. You become calloused to what's happening. And you begin to fall into that area of sin. The more we sin, the easier it gets. We need to be so careful that the use of our liberties doesn't cause other people to sin. Verse 13. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, Paul says, I will never eat meat lest I make my brother stumble. Paul's laying out a principle for Christians of all ages. It's better for the Christian to follow the way of love and forfeit the rights and the liberties that he has before Christ than to, than to cause a Christian to stumble in his or her spiritual walk. In Romans chapter 14, verse 20, Paul says this. He says, Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for a man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. Several years ago, uh, I, a long time ago, I worked in, in retail. Uh, I, it's pretty neat because I, I was in retail 22 and a half years and now I've been in ministry 22 and a half years, so all that time. But when, we, when I go all the way back to my retail days, I was starting in ministry and uh, I, I, I was working in Awana as an Awana commander at the church and God had a sense of humor. He put me working at the church right across the street from where I was, uh, or the store right across the street from where I was working uh, as, as an Awana commander. And I used to have a horrible temper back in those days, and you may not believe it, but boy, I had it. I, I would go in the back room of my produce department, and I would get boxes of lettuce. I'd be pounding on those boxes. I'd take those boxes, I'd smash them on the floor, throw stuff around when I got going. I'd just let loose, and, and sometimes even in the aisle, I would, I would get bad. I had one, one night, uh, things just got to me to the point. I was out at 9 o'clock at night. How I kept my job, I have no idea. I was out there, I, I, I was so mad. I got a tomato, and all the way down the aisle, I just fired as hard as I could and splatted that thing right on the wall and went back to work again. And <laughs> I had a temper. So God, in his sense of humor, says, okay, Mike, I'm going to put you in the store right across the street from where you are a spiritual leader and a want a commander. And I get across there and I'm working and finally I found, by the way, I, I, I have a trigger. And, and if you have a problem with anger, if you look around, you'll find you've got a trigger somewhere and you've got to find what that trigger is. And, and my trigger was working too hard and I want everything perfect. And I just push myself and I get angrier and angrier. And I had one of those days and I'm out there trying to catch up and I'm working like crazy and I'm getting madder and madder and just ready to explode on the aisle. And right behind me, I hear a lady say, 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 Mr. Bernard, thank you for being my child's Awana leader. Church face comes on. <laughs> we turn around. Everything's cool, right? Okay, so I got away with that one. But the next week, next week I'm out there and I'm getting angry. We're, getting, we're working hard. Things aren't going well. And I'm, I'm getting, so you can tell with the produce because I'm slamming hard when I'm working. But I'm out there getting madder and madder and ready to go. And behind me, I hear this little voice, Mommy, my Awana leader. <sighs> Down I come, and church face comes on, and, and you do it, right? I'm not kidding you. One more week, same thing happened. And this time it was a, a parent behind me. And just as I'm ready to let loose and explode, Mr. Bernard, Thank you so much for being my child's Awana leader. Boy, what a difference that's making in their life. <sighs> Down I came. And you know, the Lord delivered me of that anger. I found the trigger. He delivered me of the anger. But I learned something even more important through that. The moment that we come to Christ, the moment that we say that we are a Christian and we take a public stand for Jesus, we are living in a fishbowl. You understand that? People realize that. They are watching us. And the thing about fishbowls is you don't always know who's watching. And so it's important that we be careful the way that we live our lives. 
And I think that principle can be taken and applied to chapter 8 here too. Because the moment that we come to Christ, from that moment on, we're living in a fishbowl. Whether we're in a restaurant drinking a glass of wine, whether we're doing whatever it might be, we're living in a fishbowl. We don't know who's walking, watching. It can have negative spiritual implications for those individuals. And we need to follow the way of love. Amen? Yes. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you. I thank you so much for your word. And this has been a hard lesson today. And it seems like we're, we're being hit with new things all the time in our culture. And yet at the same time, the principles are laid out. And we just need to take those principles and, and apply them to these situations so that we can honor you. Lord, uh, each and every one of us who has, have trusted Christ have received the greatest gift of all, that being eternal life. But once we do, Lord, we live in that fishbowl and people are watching us. So when we get into those gray areas, when we get into those situations in which we need to make our minds up on how we're going to act in a certain situation or a certain setting, help us, Lord, to remember that people are watching. Help us to remember that you died for your people. And Lord, we don't want to mess up their walk in any way, shape, or form. Help us, Lord, to live our lives in such a way in which we're living out the way of love and doing the best for fellow believers. Lord, if there's someone here today who's never received Christ, I, I pray that they not walk out of here today without doing so, realizing that the greatest gift of all is Jesus. The greatest gift of all is eternal life that comes through him and that sacrifice on the cross. And Lord, if somebody is here and hasn't received Jesus, I encourage them just to pray along this line. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. Lord, I have sinned so much. My life has, has been a mess. I thank you that through your death on the cross, Lord, through, by grace through faith, that our sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. I repent. I change my mind. I change direction. Lord, I receive you today as my Savior and Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.